the good news is that they didn't burn me like they did uh, a few previous scientific martyrs, and uh, which means I can speak with you today. And I'm going to speak about two topics. The first part of my talk is about alcohol and how we can have a more rational approach to the pleasures of alcohol uh, and, a, and a way we can potentially minimize the harms. And the second part, I will talk about psychedelics. So let's start with the alcohol. And I guess it's pretty much everyone's drug, uh, uh, unless you uh, live in a, a Muslim country. And here are some images. You can see Bacchus, the baby Bacchus, ancient Greek god of alcohol, starting very young. You can see Jesus converting water into wine to facilitate a wed the wedding at Cani. You can see a monk brewing alcohol. And you can see a couple of images from Hogarth, the uh, gin alley uh, and, um, and beer lane. And uh, you can see the differences between sensible drinking of beer and excessive drinking of gin. And of course, alcohol is with us from the day we're born to the day we die. It is the uh, universal drug for social gatherings to celebrate or commiserate. And that's because alcohol is the ultimate social drug. Alcohol is extremely popular. Uh, the market for alcohol in the world is over one trillion pounds a year. But of course, alcohol is harmful. And probably every family in Britain has, has knows someone that has been harmed by alcohol. And you can see there the WHO data suggests that it contributes to 3.3 premature deaths a year, million premature deaths a year, and the uh, costs of alcohol up to 500 billion. And when we did a sub study in 2010, the bottom graph, you can see that alcohol came out as the most harmful drug in the UK, largely because of the size of the red bar. And the red bar is the harm of the drug to other people. And you can see that alcohol is way the most harmful drug to other people in the UK. Uh, probably because it's so widely used. But it does also does have intrinsic harms. The size of the blue bar gives you an indication of the, of the comparative harms. And alcohol is not the most harmful drug, but it's still more harmful than drugs to the right of it, such as cannabis. And at the very right-hand end, the psychedelics, which I'll talk about later, have very low harms both to the individual and to society. And it was saying that they got me sacked. And uh, since then, I've been campaigning and working to try to see if we can reduce the harms of alcohol. And I'm not the only one. A recent sur YouGov survey suggested that a lot of people in Britain are trying to reduce their drinking or to um, stop drinking altogether. And in the middle graph here, that with the, the, the histogram there, you see that the millennials are particularly interested in reducing the health harms of alcohol. And that spans all the different social groups from A down to T. And also on the right hand side, you see it's something that's becoming particularly relevant. 31% of of course, if you find over and the baby's waking you up at five, it's a, it's a very, very uh, too much the night before. Can we facilitate this uh, ch change, this trend towards reducing drinking? Well, the ambition that I've been developing in the last 10 years is it came out of a government foresight report uh, that I ran back in 2005, which said maybe we could replace alcohol. Maybe if we understood how, how alcohol worked in the brain, we could find alternatives which had less or none of the negative effects of alcohol. So where does alcohol work in the brain? Well, it works in many, many different places. It probably affects all brain. But the good effects, the green arrows there, the good effects such as sociability and relaxation, the reasons we want alcohol, are located in the front of the brain, on the left side there. And all the red arrows tell you where the bad effects come from. Uh, and so if we would, uh, wanted to replicate alcohol, we would target the good effects by targeting the chemicals in the brain which alcohol works through to mediate those effects. And that is where we started. two key neurotransmitters, two key brain chemicals that we have to think about when we're dealing with alcohol. One is glutamate. Glutamate is the arousal chemical that makes you alert and active, make you angry and aggressive. Uh, and then there is this other chemical called GABA, the chemical in the brain which calms you down. It gives you some immunity, conviviality, sex of glutamate. Many times when we are drinking, we're drinking to dampen down glutamate activity, 
because alcohol increases GABA, the, which counteracts the effects of glutamate. And we now know that the positive effects of alcohol are mediated through enhancing GABA. But the problem is with alcohol, if we take too much of it, then it, it overwhelms other brain functions, particularly the mate system. And so essentially what we're trying to do is develop uh, drinks which can give you the desired effects of alcohol, but without overwhelming the brain and of course, without over affecting the body in the way that alcohol affects the liver and the heart, etc. So this is a classic example of less stimulation, a more focused stimulation, giving you a more desirable effect. On the drinking, particularly people who have a problem with alcohol, they're walking deep precipice. A little alcohol over, and they'll be in problems, behavioral problems, addiction, etc. And what we're trying to do is give people a drink which will allow them to meander through those beautiful green fields without the risk of dropping over the edge uh, of uh, excessive um, interference with glutamate. And over the last decade, um, Gabbard Labs has been developing compounds which we hope will do this. So uh, one approach is to do very sophisticated and target the GABA receptors and mediate the good effects of alcohol. And we can do this by making uh, substances called um, uh, partial agonists, which turn on those receptors, but don't overstimulate them. And the top image there, the little blue bars, they show you a prototype. So this is a human experience, human testing of a prototype, synthetic alcohol, where you see the question asked is, alcohol, does it feel like alcohol? You see, see, over a period of about 90 minutes, people rate it as feeling like alcohol, and then the effect disappears, which of course is what we want. We want a drink to not only mimic the good effects of alcohol, but also not to last too long, just in the same way as alcohol is written. Pathetic through to becoming a drink is quite a challenge. Uh, if we have to go through food safety testing, and that can take many years and will cost many millions of pounds. So in the interim, we have developed an alternative, which is now on the market. It's called Sentia Spirits, and it's a botanical alternative. We've sought out uh, from all across the world uh, various uh, herbs which will mimic the effects of alcohol, enhance scabbit in the brain. And we've turned it into a, a rather pleasant drink, as I say, which is now available. And on the bottom it, a set of uh, lines there, the, the graph shows that when you drink Sentia, you, for instance, increase the blue bar, shows you increase your uh, relaxation, and the, the bot at the bottom you have the orange bar, which is irritability, that goes down. And you can see across the, the board, Sentia does enhance the uh, subjective effects which we want to uh, enhance and it does to some extent mimic uh, the beneficial sociability effects of alcohol. So that's uh, that's where we are with helping to reduce the harms of alcohol. Well, let's move on now to psychedelics. Now psychedelics have been around probably as long as alcohol. They different cultures over very many thousands of years have used drugs ranging from peyote, magic mushrooms, ayahuasca, Amanita muscaris, but the really important image here is the bottom left. And that's a 3,000 year old Greek vase, and that shows a Greek noble person taking ergot. And ergot is a fungus, you can see it there, a black fungus that grows on cereals. And the Greeks knew that when the fungus grew, they didn't know it was a fungus, they thought it was part of the plant, but when cereals got damp towards the autumn, the fungus would grow and they would eat the fungus. In fact, they would have celebrations. The Greek the Lucinian Mysteries, their, their great celebrations of art and culture and music and dance were fueled by this psychedelic substance, which is like a, a mild form of LSD that's found in ergot. And I think most of us would agree that our current society is, is largely based on Greek culture. Uh, and you could make a very plausible case that it was these mysteries fueled by a psychedelic that actually led to the Greeks coming up with the chemical and actually foundation of our world today. Oh, 
Oh, so Professor Nutt, just when he was talking about my very, very favourite subject, psychedelic medicines, has to drop off the call. He's going to rejoin us, I understand, in my ear because I have an earpiece because I'm a trained television presenter these days and not an applied behavioural science practitioner. Um, but he was talking about alcohol and then just clicked on to psychedelics and the Eleusian mysteries, which if you haven't heard about this, as I said, the, the revolution is very much coming. Um, I think next he was about to talk about Aldous Huxley and his mescaline experience, which um, ultimately has shaped the path of psychedelics today. Aldous believed that we should give um, psychedelics, LSD, uh, psilocybin uh, to the intelligentsia, and then that this would sort of diffuse into society. But unfortunately, a man called Timothy Leary came along and uh, spoiled it for everyone a little bit uh, by trying to give it to absolutely everyone and making the authorities hate him and psychedelic medicines in the process, despite their therapeutic benefits. Do we have have Professor Nutt live again? Is this what I'm hearing? No, we don't. I'm not sure, but I think you're doing such a fantastic job. Well, in, in, I'd, I'd be happily present his slides <laughs> because I think if we click onto the next slide, I don't know, he, he may be able to do that back at home. Um, there's a fantastic image. If you've ever come across it, um, get ready to have your mind blown. Uh, the revolution is televised live from sea containers. And the, the next image in his slide actually shows, uh, if you click onto the next one, um, I can click, can I? Yes, brain imaging, um, uh, fMRI scanners. We've only had this technology in recent recent years and it's allowed us to really peer into the mind, see what's going on. This beautiful data visualization shows us the resting brain state, the normal brain state. And against that, we have the brain during a in a psychedelic experience, in a psychedelic state. And this is meant to represent the connectivity of the, of the neural networks. Now in your resting brain state, what's typically going on is that your default mode network, which kind of orchestrates your resting brain state, this is what's in charge. And so all of those strengthen neural pathways Ways, the neural pathways that have been strong since a childhood, since childhood, are reconfirming themselves on a daily basis. And this is kind of your, your resting brain state. And also when you're not really thinking about anything at all, this is what your brain looks like. These are the connections going on. You throw in a psychedelic medicine uh, in the right set and setting, as we say in psychedelic therapy, in the right environment, uh, a nurturing environment conducive uh, to the therapeutic state. And what you get is uh, you're shaking the snow globe. Uh, suddenly parts of the brain that never normally speak to each other are allowed to do so. Um, and so you've got um, a synesthesia is very common. People uh, being able to taste a color or see a piece of music. Um, and uh, he, it's one of the other analogies is that it's like if, uh, if parts of the brain are very far away in your resting brain state, they're over the mountain, this kind of flattens the landscape so that everything is easy to access, e easy to get to. And um, trauma, uh, past experiences in life that may have conditioned your thinking, that they can be revisited, that they can ultimately be, be healed. Um, through, through revisiting those experiences, through recognizing them, bringing enlightenment um, to that. I'm not prepared to present all of this, but I, as you can tell, I'm highly informed on the subject matter. Um, I think on our next slide, we have a, a quote from Albert Einstein. I haven't actually seen Professor Nutt's slides ahead of time, um, so this is all new to me, but the subject matter certainly isn't. Um, Professor Nutt out of a job here. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's Professor Nutt's research <laughs> Imperial that has really led the world along with Johns Hopkins. Um, but we are going to move on now, I think. Um, hopefully, you've got a little snippet of uh, just what psychedelic therapy uh, can and, and will hopefully offer the planet in the coming years. Um, Tara, please take it away with some of the questions that are coming through the channels. We have a little bit of Q&A, although, of course, we dropped off before anyone was able to ask you some questions about the psychedelics. So I'll, I'll kick off with that. Um, I tried to represent poorly some of the some of the research that's coming through at the moment from Imperial, but it's it's groundbreaking stuff. It's it's life changing. It's society changing as far as I can see. What is it that's holding back these medicines as you see it, and what can we do about that? Well, they're not yet, they're not yet yet approved as medicines. This in every country in the world, the psilocybin and LSD are, are treated as Schedule One drugs under the UN conventions. That's 227 countries ban them. I don't think any country has them has allowed them as a medicine yet. Uh, and that's because of the myths, the myths that they're very dangerous, the myth that they're very addictive, and um, and the fear is that they will actually change people's uh, attitudes to establishment, etc. But you see in your labs at Imperial that these, these medicines work. And, and one of the questions I had is whether or not people like us uh, are going to be making 
anti-smoking campaigns in 20 years time if with one dose of psilocybin or, or two um but a single mm. six hour session yeah. you may never smoke again mm. um how do you see this playing out in the future oh i think it's it, there's no question the psychedelics will be the next great revolution in psychiatry and in addiction there is absolutely no question about that and in i think the weight of evidence is slowly building up so that the people what politicians will have to open the doors they will have to allow them to become medicines in the same way as the the pressure um particularly the demands from patients led to medical cannabis being made uh, legal in now in about 20 countries patients want it it, it will change health outcomes so powerfully that it, it's, it's come up it will be completely perverse to keep these drugs illegal especially as keeping them illegal doesn't actually stop recreational use all it does is stop doctors using them absolutely I, I was listening recently to a lady from the cluster busters organization they call them suicide mm. headaches yeah. and and psilocybin of course yes. is, is working for them too mm. um you mentioned cannabis absolutely. medical cannabis and it, it's interesting to note that i think in the uk we've only we've recently had legislation um for medical mm. access to cannabis um and yet something like only 18 prescriptions were uh, delivered in the last year. So the social norm yeah. is really lagging behind the legislation. How do we make sure that something like that doesn't happen with psychedelic medicines, do you think? Well, we need to learn the lessons from cannabis. The reason cannabis isn't being prescribed, even though it's uh, been available for two and a half years, is because doctors don't know how to prescribe it. Yeah. So we have to educate the medical profession as well as educating patients. And they, we have to do it ideally together so that when patients go to their doctor and say, I, I'd like psilocybin for, for my um, depression, the doctor actually understands what they're talking about and is not stuck in that sort of traditional prejudicial view. Where if it's illegal, then it must be dangerous. Well, I, I could talk to you all day about psychedelics, but we must talk about the fantastic work that you're doing on, on, with alcohol, your recent book on drinking, which I think is, is changing the agenda and many people's conception of, uh, of what it is to be an alcohol user, should I even say that. Um, uh, with al uh, we've got some questions coming in here. Why do you think that tobacco has had so much attention in policy, but not alcohol? Because the drinks industry is much more subtle and effective at lobbying to protect its position than the tobacco industry. The tobacco industry made a fatal mistake, which was lying about the pharmacology of tobacco. The drinks industry has learned from that. And it now it basically just accepts that alcohol is a problem, but it says it's your problem. If you drink responsibly, you won't have a problem. And of course, my book is largely about trying to help people understand how you can drink responsibly. It's not necessarily very easy, particularly for people who are predisposed to becoming alcohol dependent. People are very interested in, in the, the GABA agonist, have I got that right, uh, Sentia. I've tried it myself, it's delicious. I love it with a bit of tonic. Um, people are asking what are the health effects and, and hangovers and things like that. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Well, so the, what we, as I said, what we're trying to do is give people the sociability, the conviviality, a, a drink which they can drink instead of alcohol. Um, what we're using with Sentia, you know, these are basically food products or food supplements that can, uh, you know, we've got relatively uh, good history of uh, of safety. So uh, also we know that even if you drank a lot, you wouldn't get very intoxicated. And, and as yet, we haven't had any reports of um, of any hangovers. No hangovers. Well, that's something. I think there might be one tomorrow uh, around here. Professor Nutt, I'm so sorry. We're out of time. There's so much more that we could ask you. Um, but thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. It's been a delight. Um, uh, what a man of... Uh, it's been great. Uh, <laughs> what a man of, of science. What a man of integrity. And what a nudge stock we are having and what a nudge stock I am having <laughs> um, today. It's really been something. Ah!